um, everyone. I'm Courtney Adair Johnson. I'm the gallery director here at Tennessee State University in the Department of Art and Design. I would like to welcome you all um, to the Department of Art and Designs We Shall Overcome celebrates the 60th anniversary of the Freedom Riders. Before we start, I'd like to take a few minutes to honor this land. I will read a short statement and then take a moment of silence to reflect. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional indigenous inhabitants of this land. We pay respect to their elders past and present. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement and migration and settlement that bring us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. It is a small step towards honoring native communities and enacting a much larger project of decolonization and reconciliation, along with a way to connect us back to protecting Mother Earth and the life the Earth sustains. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're excited to welcome each and every one of you here today to talk and honor the 60th anniversary of the Freedom Riders. This is a chance to reflect and honor those that paved the way for a more just and fair world. The show We Shall Overcome, Civil Rights in the Nashville Press, 1957 to 1968, was organized and presented by curator Katie Delmay at the Frist Art Museum in, 19, in 2018. <laughs> Me and numbers. <laughs> um, the show is now presently up at the TSU Department of Art and Design's Hiram Van Gordon Gallery. And you can see it also online at www.mspar.org backslash WSO. We invite you to check out the show um, online or in the gallery. Um, you can contact me personally. I'll put my email in the chat um, to make a reservation to see the show in person. We Shall Overcome was comprised, is comprised of 50 photographs from the archives of the Tennessean and the Nashville Banner. They document the critical fight for racial equity in Nashville. The pictures were taken from 1957, the year that desegregation in Nashville public schools began, and 1968, when the National Guard was called in to surround the state capitol in the wake of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in Memphis. Of central significance are images of lunch counter sit-ins led by students from local historic black colleges and universities, including Tennessee State University, then was Tennessee A&I, and took place in the early 1960s. Many of these same students traveled to Birmingham in 1961 to continue the freedom rides that the original group was attacked and beaten. 14 TSU students were expelled because of the acts of resistance. Some of these images were printed in the newspaper, but many were not. This exhibition offers an opportunity to consider the roles of images in the media in shaping public opinion, a relevant subject in today's news saturated climate. This was organized by the Frist Art Museum. All images generously provided by the Tennessean and the Nashville Public Library Special Collections, which houses the Nashville Banner Archives. We are, here, we are joined here today from esteemed, with esteemed colleagues in history and arts to honor this important Nashville history and national history. We will start the conversation off with a reading of the late and great John Lewis's foreword from We Shall Overcome. Press photographs of Nashville during the civil rights era edited by Catherine E. Delmay. The Frist Art Museum published this with Vanderbilt University Press, and it truly is a beautiful book. I'll put the link in our chat if anyone wants to go check it out. Um, we're lucky to be joined by mass communications professor Ashanti Mason Chambers as she reads John Lewis's reflection, reflective and poignant forward. Follow her on social media to see the fabulous work that Mason Chambers is doing with the Aristocrat of Bands, she is a 2011 TSU alumni coming back to TSU, continuing the think, work, serve. 
motto that we all embrace here. Um, we'll also have conversations from historian Linda Wynn, a national treasure and Fisk professor with curator Katie Delmay of We Shall Overcome. They will discuss an overview of the exhibition with a focus on the roles of students at our local HBCUs and Nashville's role in the civil rights. Linda T. Wynn contributed a chapter to the award-winning We Shall Overcome catalog entitled Nashville, an Inspirational City. Wynn curated and narrated Nashville Sites, Nashville Civil Rights Walk Movement Walking Tour, among many other accolades. Katie Delmay has personally cheerleaded me along with supported local artists in shows like Murals of North Nashville and In 2020, which is up right now on their website by a TSU alum. She brings historical content, community and social equity to the center of her curatorial practice. Thank you for bringing We Shall Overcome to light. We also have the Department of Language, Literature and Philosophies LLP for short. I want to write initiative students and the LLP's chair, Dr. Michelle Pinkard, join in us. They will recite poetry written from the images of We Shall Overcome. And then we'll have a closing poet from Soulfire, a TSU poetry and spoken word club. I highly recommend checking out I Wanna Write's initiative. The publications, publications based on the I we Shall Overcome show. Dr. Pinker will introduce the poets and give us more insight into the work before their appearance. TSU's history professor, Dr. Lee Rotha Williams reflects on TSU students continuing the legacy and movement from lunch counter sit-ins, the 14 freedom riders, to those that fought for basic education rights before them. If you're not familiar with Dr. Williams' work on the North Nashville Heritage Project, an effort that seeks to encourage a greater understanding of Nashville's, North Nashville's history, including but not limited Jefferson Street and its historical relationship to the greater Nashville community. I suggest you check it out now because it's phenomenal. I'll put all these links in as we, we go along. Um, so now I will hand it over to um, Mass Communications Professor Ashanti Mason Chambers as she reads John Lewis's foreword from the book, We Shall Overcome. Hello everyone. And thank you, Courtney, for uh, that lovely introduction and for having me, it is a pleasure. So I will go ahead and read and get started for you. Again, this was a foreword written by John Lewis. The truth is sometimes hard to face, but we must face it. We must examine it. We must remember it. The truth will set us free. And the truth of Nashville civil rights movement is right here between the pages of We Shall Overcome, press photographs of Nashville in the civil rights era. These photos are real portraits of what happened in the 1960s in Nashville, Tennessee. They were taken by photographers from the city's two major daily newspapers at the time, the Tennessean and the Nashville Banner. They reflect the struggle, the suffering, and the courage of people determined to end hatred, violence, and racism. They are a record of those who made our country more just and fair, and those who tried to crush justice and fairness. I was there. I will never forget. But you did not have to be there, sitting at a lunch counter, riding a bus, or marching in the street to learn the lessons of history and apply them to today. Open this book. You will see photographs that document the bombings, the arrest, the beatings, and the pain and fear we felt as we were arrested, thrown into paddy wagons, and taken to jail. These images also reflect hope and progress. We were just ordinary people with an extraordinary vision that the nonviolent resistance taught by Martin Luther King Jr. and Mahatma Gandhi could help create a beloved community that values the dignity and the worth of every human being. We had faith that sacrificing our bodies to this ideal would ultimately change our hearts and minds. Our protests were love and action. 
We wanted to redeem not only our attackers, but the very soul of America. I believe we did so, but I also believe we must keep doing so. If our current political climate shows us anything, it is that old hatreds will reassert themselves if good people do not keep pressing the case for the beloved community. Perhaps the greatest gift of Nashville civil rights history is that it reminds us when we can make a difference. No matter how fierce the adversary, no matter how organized the opposition, no matter how powerful the resistance, nothing can stop the movement of a disciplined, determined peoples motivated by justice. So, excuse me, so let's keep moving. We have come a great distance in just a few decades. We still have a distance to go. We still need to change the social, political, economic and religious structures around us. We still need a revolution of values and ideas in this nation and throughout the world. We still need to build a beloved community, a nation and a world at peace with itself. This book reminds us that it was possible once and is possible still. Congressman John Lewis, U.S. Representative for Georgia's 5th District. Thank you. Wow, that's, that's really amazing. That's kind of a hard act to follow. Although Courtney, if I'm looking at our syllabus, I think I'm up now, right? <laughs> um, those words are so, they were incredibly beautiful two years ago when we first, three years ago now when we first read them. And I think they're even more poignant today, not only because we've lost Congressman Lewis, since he wrote those, but also what's happening, you know, in these last few days and weeks. It's encouraging to keep keep moving, as he says, keep keep getting into into good trouble. Um, well, I and, and thank you, Ashante, for for reading that. That was really quite beautiful. Um, so thank you, Courtney, for for having me and for gathering this group together to talk about an exhibition that um, really is quite near and, and, and dear to my heart. Um, I must say that I am not a Nashville native, but I've been here for over 25 years. I've been at the Frist, a curator at the Frist for, for 20 years, in fact. And um, during my time here, I've learned that even though we, um, we get taught about Greensboro and Little Rock and Birmingham, when we learn about the civil, the modern civil rights movement in the US, um, that Nashville, my now adopted hometown town, actually played a really important role in, in the civil rights movement too. We, um, the, our plan for integrating public schools um, was considered a success and was um, adapted by many schools throughout the, the Southeast. We um, were the first metropolis to actually integrate places of business in 1960. And perhaps most significantly and most relevant to this group is um, that we were really a hub for training students, um, students like John Lewis, like Diane Nash, like Bernard Lafayette, who were um, at local HBCUs, TSU, Fisk, American Baptist College, Meharry Medical College. Um, and they took this, um, this form of nonviolent protest. Uh, it started here in Nashville, but then they really brought it throughout the, the Southeast. Um, and figures like Congressman Lewis, of course, devoted his whole life to, um, to that. So I had long known, um, or I had learned about this history, and I had known that there was a great trove of these photographs at the Nashville Civil Rights Room at the library. Um, but I wanted to present an exhibition that um, um, would be on view at the First Art Museum, um, where we would have, um, you know, we have over 200,000 people that come through our doors. Um, and we just thought that this would be a great way to tell the story. 
not only for the the new generations for the the younger kids if you will that are growing up that need to know what happened here in in nashville but the many newcomers that are moving to the city of course people like me who maybe didn't know about this initially and we certainly felt like it was a worthy enough topic to be readdressed with those who lived through it um, so once I got a green light to organize this exhibition, I realized that this was an incredibly deep and rich and complicated topic. And um, all the research in the world I knew I would do in the couple of years leading up to the show could never replace um, those, um, you know, the, the, the lifetime of scholarship that other um, that, that local professors had put into this um, work. And I was introduced to Professor Linda Wynn, who's at the Tennessee Historical Commission, as well as um, a professor at Fisk University, who is considered really the, the, the leading scholar in this material and reached out and asked if she would be willing to partner with us and to serve what I came to call to be my academic advisor to steer me not only to, to different readings, but also just to kind of explain, um, you know, the basics of, of things that happen, but then to really go into some of the nuances of, of the movement. And she really, I'm eternally grateful for her generosity with, um, with sharing her knowledge and really helping to shape this exhibition when we were able to produce a book, which wasn't originally planned to accompany the show. Um, she also graciously, as Courtney mentioned, wrote uh, an essay to um, provide context for the exhibition. So, um, so as Courtney said, there are 50 photos in the show. They range in date from 1957 to 1968. There are five different groupings for those of you who were able to see her little walkthrough before five o'clock, you may have noticed, but we thought given the, you know, that the, this presentation here at TSU and 2021, the 60th anniversary of the Freedom Rides, that we would really center our conversation tonight on um, two of, of the sections, one having to do with the, um, the sit-ins in 1960, and then the role, um, the, the integration, um, the, the protests, the, the movement for integration that occurred um, after that through maybe 64, 65 or so. So um, Professor Wynn, um, I really am going to turn things over to, to you, but, I, um, but first I want to share a, my screen and it looks like it's actually working to, at this moment. Hooray, that doesn't always happen. Even a year into all this, it doesn't always work for me. Um, here is um, just a slide that shows what became our, our signature image for the exhibition. Um, here's an installation shot of the show that was on view at the Frist. And did I ever mention that we finally um, decided that the right time for, for, um, for organizing the show would be in 2018, which was the, um, the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So that's our time frame. It was up at the Frist for almost seven years and here, or sorry, seven months. And here are a couple of installation shots of the galleries at, at TSU. Um, so I'll just maybe kind of glance or take us through quickly some of the, the early pictures, Professor Wynn, and then maybe um, ask you to speak a little bit, uh, provide an, uh, an overview of what happened in 1960 here in Nashville and why it was so important. Um, here okay. are, are, does that sound okay? That's fine. Okay, great. So here are some photographs where you see parents walking their children to school. Again, this is um, 1957, three years after um, Board versus Brown of uh, Brown uh, Brown versus Board of Education mandated that the schools should be integrated. Obviously, we were quite slow to get there, but we were among the first in the southeast where it did happen. Um, here you see um, Errol Groves with his his new classmates. Um, there were protests that occurred. Um, Casper, uh, John Casper, a someone who came from out of town, is thought to really have kind of whipped up the crowds. Um, there were there was violence. Unfortunately, a school in East Nashville, Hattie Cotton, was um, was bombed, and you can see this young boy is looking at that quite per perplexed. Um, and sadly, the one um, African American child who had attended school the previous day, this happened um, the evening of the first day of school, returned back 
to his, um, his, his all black school. Um, but the, um, the next major moment in the, the modern civil rights movement here in Nashville began in 1960. Although actually, I, Professor Wynn, I know you would say it started a little bit earlier. Just when, a little bit. When, yes. Um, but especially when King and James Lawson met and um, he uh, persuaded uh, Lawson to come south. So maybe do you want to kind of start with that and then explain what we're seeing in these photos? Okay, uh, the reason I say it started a little bit earlier than that, when you go back to the school desegregation case that was led by Reverend Kelly Miller Smith, uh, Kelly the barber and the attorneys involved, once they started that phase, uh, Kelly Miller Smith Sr. had established the Nashville Christian Leadership Conference, which was like a branch of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference started by Dr. King and others in 1957. And so they were discussing what other projects they wanted to do. And initially uh, voting had been on their agenda. Uh, but what happened in the interim is North Carolina a t on February the 1st. Uh, and prior to that, they, well, they decided that they would deal with desegregating uh, lunch counters here in Nashville. And in order to prepare the students for that, uh, they actually conducted uh, studies or, or actually the students were actually involved in uh, test beatings, if you will. Uh, and when North Carolina took place on the first, Nashville students had actually participated in what they called test sit-ins. And the whole purpose of the test sit-in was to really discern if in fact lunch counters were segregated. Uh, and so in November and December of 1959, they actually conducted test sit-ins with the intention of beginning set-ins the following year. Uh, they were held up a little bit by the adult leaders because they wanted to have things in place such as attorneys, uh, they wanted to raise money for bail. They wanted to have uh, physicians in place in case young people were hurt. Uh, but on February the 1st, North Carolina students beat them and gained national attention. So 12 days later, uh, Nashville had its first organized sit-in to take place in, in downtown Nashville, and that was February the 13th, 1960. Uh, it was not until February 1960 on the 27th that they actually experienced violence. Uh, many of the students who were sitting passively, if you will, at lunch counters experienced uh, being beaten and assaulted. Uh, there were tens of students of somewhere in the 80s or 90s uh, that were actually arrested and taken to jail. Uh, some of the other leaders in Nashville, in addition to Reverend Kelly Miller Smith, was the Reverend C.T. Vivian, as well as the Reverend James Lawson, who had come to Nashville to attend Vanderbilt uh, Divinity School. And at some point, uh, Reverend Lawson had uh, met Dr. King and Lawson said, you know, one day I'm going to get involved in the, uh, the movement. And King sort of said, well, why don't you come on now? Now that was not his purpose for coming here, but once he came here to Nashville to attend school, he did become involved in the movement. He was one of the instructors uh, for the students. One of the things that separated the Nashville movement from some of the other movements was that the students here were actually trained in nonviolent resistance. 
they were taught how to protect themselves when they were sitting at lunch counters. They had to read and study Thoreau and Reinhardt and Gandhi uh, and others. Uh, so for many of the students, especially the student leaders in Nashville, nonviolence became a philosophical way of life as opposed to a technical way of life. Uh, and what I mean by that is that they really lived the philosophy of nonviolence. Uh, other students participated, may not have lived it philosophically, but they could go through it tactically uh, to achieve a means to an end. Uh, Lawson was ultimately arrested uh, for teaching students about the nonviolence uh, direct movement and being involved in the sit-ins. He, he was expelled from Vanderbilt University and ultimately he left uh, Vanderbilt. Uh, he went to, he ended up in Memphis in 1968. And actually he is the one who invited Dr. King to come to Memphis for the sanitation workers strike. Uh, so, you know, you go through the movement, uh, attorney Z. Alexander Hope, Luby's home was bombed uh, and that sparked a massive march uh, from Jefferson Street to the mayor's office. Uh, and it was there and a back and forth uh, debate between C.T. Vivian, Diane Nash, who was the head of the student movement here. And I wanna point out that you know, we're talking about 1960 and you have a woman that is in a leadership position, which was a little unusual. Uh, she, that prior to her taking over the student movement, uh, there were two male leaders, uh, but they weren't getting the job done. Uh, and so she was ultimately selected to be the leader of that group. Uh, the conversation between Mayor Ben West, the Reverend C.T. Vivian, uh, was somewhat of a heated uh, argument or debate. And ultimately, it was the question or the debate between C.T. Vivian and one of the mayor's responses that Diane asked Mayor West, then Mayor, do you believe that lunch counters should be desegregated? And he answered, yes. Uh, you know, one of the things that I really enjoyed about this project was that we actually looked at what the press was saying uh, during all of that time. And it, it's really interesting when you go in and you look at what's in the Tennessean, you see what's in the banner. Uh, for those of you who may not be native to Nashville, the Tennessean was considered the more moderate press. Uh, the banner was the conservative paper. Uh, it was ran by Stallman, who also served on the board of trustees at Vanderbilt University. And in my opinion, had a great deal to do with Lawson being arrested. Uh, but that was the exciting part for me is when you can look at the local press and see what is being said in the local press about the movement uh, that was taking place in the 1960s. When Mayor West answered yes, uh, the paper the next morning read, Mayor says desegregate, and I'm paraphrasing that a little bit, but that was the, the genesis of the beginning of Nashville becoming the first major city in the South to begin desegregating its lunch counters. Uh, in May, I think it was around May 10th, seven of the original stores that had been boycotted and where sit-ins took place desegregated their lunch counters. Uh, shortly after that, you would have other eating establishments and restaurants that would also be targeted and 
the city did not become fully desegregated in terms of public accommodations until the 1964 Civil Rights Act was passed, uh, which was signed by President Lyndon Johnson. Uh, one of the interesting things about that march it, is that it was a silent march. And that was the brainchild of Dr. Vivian, C, Reverend C.T. Vivian. Vivian had participated in sit-ins in Chicago. And in Chicago, he had used this method. And it was he who suggested that the individuals, the people, over 3,000 people, march silently down Jefferson Street to the courthouse. And if you can just use your imagination and just hear people just walking and nothing being said and reaching the courthouse and for the mayor to come out and see a throne of humanity uh, and the humanity was uh, fairly desegregated. There were both blacks and whites in that uh, throng of three over 3,000 demonstrators. Uh, but he was the, uh, the brainchild behind the silent march. And it was effective. Now, the reason they had the silent march is because Z. Alexander Luby's home was bombed. Um, and that was a bombing that was heard across Nashville. Uh, the uh, perpetrator or the uh, very racist individual who bombed the home of Z. Alexander Luby, the blast was so strong that it knocked out the windows at Meharry Medical College. Uh, it's just a miracle that G. Alexander and his wife were not hurt uh, or killed in the bombing. And so the students felt extremely close to attorney Luby. After all, he was their attorney along with approximately 10 or 11 other attorneys in Nashville. But Luby was considered the, the Dean of Civil Rights Attorneys across the state of Tennessee. And when they attempted to assassinate him, uh, that struck a chord with all of the students who had been involved and who he had assisted. Um, Katie, I don't remember if there was a slide of him representing the students in, in the courthouse. It's um, not in our PowerPoint, but we do have that in the book. Okay. Uh, but that is, is, is what galvanized the students to go and pro uh, protest what had happened uh, in Nashville and how violence was really trying to overturn nonviolence and the students refused. And that was a theme that they carried through with them even up to 1961, when you get into the Freedom Rides. Uh, Core had had a Freedom Ride on the 14th of, of May. Uh, the bust was, was bombed and set a fire. <laughs> and when, and that bus was in Anniston, Alabama. Uh, and when that took place, James Farmer, and, who was over the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, uh, decided to call off the Freedom Rides. Uh, when that word got back to Nashville, Diane Nash, John Lewis, and several members of the Student Movement uh, Association in Nashville decided that if they allowed violence to stop nonviolence, that that would be a tactic that they would use throughout the rest of the movement. And on May the 17th, I think approximately 10 students left Nashville going to continue the Freedom Ride. Uh, John Lewis, uh, I think, arrived a little bit later at the Freedom Ride. He came back to Nashville went to another place and then went uh, on the trip. Uh, the Freedom Rides were basically a continuation of something that CORE had done 
in the 1940s. Uh, and, and that was, again, trying to test the idea of interstate travel. At that time, they were going to use uh, the group consisted of, of blacks and whites. And they had even considered the idea of white women being involved and decided that that would, would be taking it a little bit too far, uh, given the, the racial climate of the time. Uh, so that is how this core uh, uh, freedom ride came in to play. And actually it was in response to a uh, Supreme Court hearing uh, decision that was passed in 1961, the Boynton case, I believe. Uh, so that's how that came about. It was, um, when, when those students decided to continue the freedom rides, uh, they were questioned not only by James Farmer, of course, he told Diane Nash that, do you all realize you will get killed? Uh, Robert Kennedy became involved. Uh, John Sickenthaler, who was an assistant to Robert Kennedy became involved. Uh, they, John, uh, Robert Kennedy wanted to know who is this Diane Nash and does she know what she's doing? Uh, Sigenthaler tried to, and eventually did get in touch with her and mentioned the fact that, you know, they needed to stop. 61 is also important because that is during the time that President Kennedy was going to have a summit with Nikita Khrushchev. And one of the uh, statements that John Kennedy made was that he did not care if they set in Freedom Road, you know, do whatever they wanted to do, but not in May when he was getting ready to have that summit with Nikita Khrushchev, because he knew that Khrushchev would use that as propaganda with Kennedy going to talk to Khrushchev about democracy and how democracy was being denied uh, members of or citizens of its own country. Uh, all of that fell, of course. Diane Nash told uh, Robert Kennedy when he mentioned in Sigenthal, do you realize that again, that there's a possibility that you will lose your life? Uh, she basically responded, we have signed our wheels uh, and we have them and they're ready to go to parents. So they were very well aware of the danger that would be involved in to continuing the sit-in, I mean, the freedom rides. Uh, ultimately, uh, Sigenthaler himself was even injured uh, doing part of the freedom rides. Uh, the late Kwame Lillard, who passed earlier this year, uh, was also involved with the freedom rides. He went and brought some of the students back uh, from participating. Uh, looking at Tennessee State, there were numerous students who were involved with that Freedom Ride. Uh, and I would highly recommend if no one has read it, uh, would be Raymond Arsenal's book uh, on the Freedom Rides. And in that book, in the table of, not the table of contents, but in uh, the back of the book, he names every student that was involved in the Freedom Rides uh, from Tennessee State, uh, from wherever they may have been. Uh, so it, it, the appendix gives you an excellent listing of students that were involved. I know that um, I happened to sit on the Metro Historical Commission and we recently approved a marker uh, for the Freedom Rides and, and John Lewis. And one of the things that is a piece of documentation, someone wanted to know who was actually involved uh, from Tennessee State. And I mentioned that book and sure enough, they were able to find 
all of the students in addition to John Lewis who was involved with the Freedom Rides. So I would highly recommend that book to students today. Uh, thank you, Courtney, that is absolutely right. Freedom Riders 1961 and the struggle for racial justice. Uh, just as a side note, uh, the students who were expelled from Tennessee State University because of their participation in the Freedom Rides, uh, I don't remember the exact year. I want to say something like maybe 2008 when they were and perhaps uh, Dr. Lee can help me on that date. Uh, the students were awarded honorary doctorate degrees uh, and uh, Raymond actually came back for that uh, as did Diane Nash and the 14 students who were removed from the institution. Uh, one of the possible studies that I would, would like to look at and I play with it off and on every now and then is the difference between what happened to the students at Tennessee State and what happened to the students at Fisk University uh, because you have a private HBCU versus a public HBCU and the public HBCU is under the uh, state government and the governor and it was the governor who insisted that those students at Tennessee State be removed from the institution and not able to complete their degrees. Uh, so that was uh, exciting uh, to do. And likewise, uh, Fisk University awarded Diane Nash an honorary degree for her role in the uh, Nashville movement while she was here. Uh, when, when we look at everything that took place with the Nashville students, Katie alluded to it. Nashville, in my opinion, is very important in the national movement. When you look at the cadre of students who left Tennessee State, this university, especially those that were considered the leaders, they fanned out across the Southeast uh, and were leaders in almost every movement that took place in the Southeast. So to me, Nashville is almost like a footnote at best and an endnote at worst in the modern narrative of this national civil rights movement. Uh, I, you know, I work off and on, on on trying to put that story together for a national context because I personally do not think uh, Nashville is given the credit that it really deserves for the number of leaders who went out of Nashville after participating here uh, who are not given really due credit for what they did across the Southeast. Uh, Martin Luther King said of this of the movement here that it was one of the best organized and most disciplined movements. And that, in my opinion, was because the students uh, who were the leaders became the philosophical advocates of direct nonviolence. So uh, it, it's a story that is worth telling. I think the 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 narrative. Uh, and the literature on the movement is still incomplete. We're finding uh, new information on movement on the movement across the Southeast every day. Uh, and I think this one certainly, Nashville story certainly needs to be put into a national context. Uh, you know, when the students continued their uh, protest, they moved from the lunch counters. They They went to the swimming pools, they went to the hotels, uh, they, they covered every aspect of accommodations. Uh, I remember being a, a recipient of their work uh, because one, I think it was my second prom, uh, high school prom that I went to, we actually went and had our prom at the Hermitage Hotel. And that was because of 
the work that the students had put forth to have those uh, places desegregated. Uh, it was not an easy battle. Uh, you, you know, just to imagine students sitting on a lunch to lunch to uh, in their finest attire. Some even had books and being beaten. Imagine go, having to go to jail for 31 and a half days where they opted not to pay bail and to remain in jail. Uh, you had both men and women who stayed in jail for 33 and a third days. Uh, the Nashville community, the black community supported the students uh, when it was suggested by the economists at Fisk University that they withdraw funds from the business area downtown. He had estimated that Black Nashvilleans pumped at least $50 million into the economy. And so once, and they really didn't call it a boycott, they called it an economic withdrawal. Once funds with, with, were withdrawn from the business community, it became a lot easier to convince uh, everyone involved that they should desegregate their lunch counters. Uh, so it's a it, it's a very interesting story, you know. When you look at people like John Lewis, who remained committed up until the day that he died, uh, the the pain that he felt going across that Edmund Pettus Bridge, uh, and having the will to continue to fight for justice and equality. And, you know, I look at where we are today uh, and it seems like we're back in a cycle of almost pre-1954 uh, across the country. And I'll say across the country because I think uh, there have been something like 360 something bills and at least between 43 and 40, six states that are dealing with, uh, they call it voting integrity or integrity of the voting box. Uh, but I see these bills as basically another form of voter suppression that was fought in uh, the 1960s. It ended in 1965 with the Voting Rights Act. Um, the Voting Rights Act was decimated by Chief Justice John Roberts in 2013. Uh, and so we are back in that battle again, uh, fighting for the right to vote. I'm reminded of a quote that Coretta Scott King said, and I'm gonna paraphrase it, but she says, freedom is one in every generation and every generation has to fight to maintain freedom. And so we're in that period where we're having to fight again, just for basic rights that are included in the governing documents of this country, uh, the United States Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Um, so, you know, with that, I, I usually give a little sermon to my students uh, that it is necessary to be involved in the political process. And by process, I mean, yes, it's great to register to vote. Yes, you must vote, but you must move beyond just voting and be engaged in the process. And that is holding those people accountable for whom you vote. You need to know how they are voting on bills that are near and dear to you are they voting your values? If you're interested in education, you need to follow what they're doing with education on the state, local, and national levels. If you're interested in social justice, you need to follow what they're doing uh, in that particular area all the way through and hold them accountable. 
And today, it is absolutely no reason not to know how people uh, or representatives on the state, local, and national level are voting on these various subjects. Uh, in the state of Tennessee, most of the committee hearings are publicized. Uh, some of the Metro meetings are publicized, or at least you can get information about them. Uh, so it's a process. It's not something that, that, that starts with registration and ends with voting. It's something that continues. And I think we need to be uh, aware of that. And as Americans, it's not just students. I think as Americans, we stop at casting the ballot. We do not carry it all the way through uh, to see how people are voting and holding them accountable. Uh, we vote them in for two, four, six years, and they come back after that amount of time and we vote them right back in. And we do not know how they have represented us uh, with issues that we may hold near and dear. Uh, and I think until that happens, we will sort of stay in this in this cycle. Uh, and I think that was the whole purpose of the movement, whether you're talking about desegregating lunch counters, having the right to vote, fair housing, uh, the issues that we're dealing with today in terms of Black Lives Matter. I don't know about you all, but I am getting so sick and tired of every day that I look at the TV, another young black person or even another young person has been shot and killed by the police. Uh, something must be done about that. Something must be done about this political climate uh, that we're in today. And I do see it as a part of civil and human rights. Uh, I believe that we narrowly escaped on January the 6th. Democracy as we know it was survived by the thinnest of threats. Uh, and I don't think that threat is over. Uh, I think that the young people of the 1960s and even those who are out there fighting today are reminding us that we have to be, we must be actively involved in our political uh, apparatus. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, that's what this movement was about. It may not have been articulated that way, but if we go in and look at it and do a comparison of then and now, uh, I think they are speaking to us. I think John Lewis is still speaking to us. He's telling us still to get in good trouble. Uh, and we need to be in good trouble today. Uh, in the 60s, it impacted a particular group of people. What is taking place today is impacting all of us as Americans. And until we realize that, uh, I'm not so sure what the future holds, but I think that we were given a blueprint uh, by those who not only fought in the 60s, uh, but those who fought from the abolitionist movement forward to fighting for, for economic and social and, and criminal justice today. Uh, so there are lessons to be learned. There are lessons to be gleaned that are very appropriate uh, for the period that we are in right now. Yes, Professor Wynn, there's so many things that you were saying that, that are so enlightening. And I think the biggest takeaway is, as you say, um, we are a country that is still struggling. There is so much that we all need to be doing to help achieve um, equity, racial equity um, here in Nashville and of course around the country. So thank you for, for sharing 
um, those words of wisdom as ever. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing our screen. And um, Courtney, I think we were going to wait till the end for questions. Is that the, the plan? Okay, great. Well, um, thank you for P Professor Wynn. And I think that um, the next, um, I believe that we're having a moment of poetry now. Yes, I think um, Dr. Pinkard will do introductions. Okay. Wow, what an impressive um, exhibit. I want to thank you and, and thank uh, Courtney and, and thank the Brist and thank you for uh, inviting us to, to witness it and, um, and for your effort. Uh, Courtney told uh, pretty much our college about this program very early in 2020, and I just grew excited, and I just approached her about what can my students do uh, to respond and engage in uh, this event, and after viewing some of the, the preview materials from the exhibit, I just decided to revamp that class altogether. And we collectively worked on something called Poetry of Witness. And essentially, student poets studied the Frist exhibit, they studied the timeline, we divvied it up, um, they focused on one, the images, but two, they used the images as a way to engage with the history. So they read articles about respective events. And I'm just gonna briefly show you the, if I could share this, the uh, results of their work before I tell you what they, they did. So um, after partnering with uh, Courtney, I reached out of course to other members in the art department and they sent me this wonderful artist who created the cover. Are we able to see my screen yet? My computer is very slow. <laughs> Yes. Okay. And so Jasmine uh, Mosley, an art major, I believe she, she's a recent graduate, gave us this cover um, titled We Shall Overcome. She was inspired by my students' poetry and the photos. And uh, she titled this work, um, Small Things to a Giant. And essentially, after that, uh, the students I want to make sure. Okay. So the students, we, we have an intro, the students divided uh, the timeline respectively. And this just turned out to be the perfect uh, assignment because they were able to see and study the shoulders upon which we stand, right? They were able to see a generation of students before them actively engaged, politically engaged and involved in the world around them and to draw inspiration. I was also thinking of something that Professor Wynn said about how Nashville and how certain efforts aren't well represented. Well, this is where the artists sort of step in and we're able to excavate and we're able to recover and we're able to take information that has been erased and put it in the art and put it back in the conversation. And so these are some, some of the goals that our students did. So thanks to the exhibition, we were able to borrow art and incorporate it in our poetry and have poetry respond to these respective images, to have a conversation with the images, to try and take our readers into this time period. And to do that, of course, we had to be both, we had to be responsible academically through the scholarship. And of course, we have to be responsible creatively through poor poetic technique. So this happened um, in the spring of 2020. I'm going to stop share there. Um, and right when we were in the middle of the project, the pandemic happened. So I'm just going to read a little bit of our, our, um, our introduction here to kind of give you a sense of what the students did. And then we have two poets from this project who came to read uh, poetry to you tonight. Um, so one, I, I appreciate them and on their, on their behalf, I thank you for inviting us. Um, it opens with a quote from James Baldwin. History is not the past, 
it is the present. We carry our history with us. We are our history. The world broke in 2020. Students enrolled in the spring semester of creative writing poetry at Tennessee State University were resolved to pick up the pieces. Our pursuit for understanding sent us deep into Nashville civil rights past. And though our efforts began before the tragic death of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter protests of 2020 that pointed the world toward change, we have found that the process of researching the leaders, protests, and revolutions of the 1960s timely and useful in illuminating the pathway forward. It is our earnest hope that this project will serve as an insightful contribution to the climb towards racial equity. So with that, I'm going to introduce um, our poets one at a time. Uh, the first one reading tonight um, is Trinity Young. And he was part of a group who was responding to the Hattie Cotton Elementary School bombing. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna pass the mic to Mr. Trinity Young. And uh, thank you. You wanna unmute yourself, Trinity. I might have to help him, let me see. All right, hello everyone. I'm Trinity and I'm a junior computer science major. And um, the poem that I wrote was inspired by the Hattie School bombing on September 10th. Um, they, they blew up the east wing of the school. And I think early in the, in the month, there were you know riots that were exciting violence. Um, before the bombing had happened. So I chose to do my poem from the perspective of a mother because, you know, I can only imagine uh, what it would be like to explain to your child, you know, such uh, act of hatred. So this poem is entitled, It Was a Dream. Um, and I'll open up with a quote from Rosa Parks. Racism is still with us but it is up to us to prepare our children for what they have to meet and hopefully we shall overcome. As a mother, I desire the best for my child. Belly full of food, head full of knowledge and a face crinkled with a smile. Their kids get it, so should mine. Never would I have taken the steps if I knew it was over that line. The line that enables someone to burn and erupt with such malice. Holding so tight to their hatred, hands calloused. Now I must sit my little girl down, tell her how this town doesn't want her. Reassuring her, not because she doesn't shine with beauty, not because she's not just as smart, not because she lacks the worthiness, reassuring her she's just as precious as ancient art. I must explain to her how she can't go to school because last night it went up in flames, blown to pieces the size of her innocent little hands, her beautiful brown skin to blame. I must tell her that it wasn't just a dream, that the thunderous boom and the rattling of our house was all real and everything that happened was exactly as it seemed. Worst of all, I must tell her that this won't be the last time. It won't be the last time people show their true colors of colorism. It won't be the last time she has to face darkness, but still gleam. If only it was just a dream. Thank you so much, Trinity. And thank you for returning. <laughs> So I very much appreciate it. And just hearing your words again, uh, it, it, it was definitely evocative. So thank you. Again, part of poetry of witness is putting ourselves in the space, translating the emotion of the moment. And so all the research that goes into it, what it sounds, what did we hear, what did we see, 
certainly his poem captured that well. And now turning to Joseph Hart, who wrote a poem about the Freedom Riders, and we're looking forward to his interpretation. So without further ado, come on, Hat. <laughs> Hi, hello, how you doing? God bless everyone. Um, I wrote this poem, um, when I wrote this poem, I had to step into um, the, reader, the Freedom Rider's shoes and I stepped into the shoes of those who got bombed. And I had to impact that to knowing that I'm traveling in a bus and I'm going far away to a place I don't know. And I don't even understand where I'm going to, but I gotta be, I gotta be, I gotta be strong. And then I make it back and I'm, I, I'm afraid, but I gotta stay strong. And I, I have to encourage the next Freedom Riders to join, to get on the bus. And um, this story, this, this poem is, is based like a letter to the next Freedom Riders called um, Dear Freedom Riders. So um, thank you and I'm, I'm honored to be here today. So it goes like this. It's your turn to ride down that lonely highway to a land unknown to you. Keep your heads held high. Don't be afraid because one day there will be books written about this day. Novels, poems, and newsletters alike. Speaking about civil rights. Some riders were bombed, some were beaten, and some were killed. We were put in jail left alone without, without a way to go home. So keep on keeping, keeping on. This fight we may not win. Just ride, I mean ride, until it's bitter end. Dr. King didn't ride with us, but that's okay. We free the riders, we didn't need him anyway. We stood stand, we stood hot, we stood. We took our stand, we took with pride. I thank God Almighty, most of us still alive. So it's your turn now, don't be afraid. We are still with you until the end of a new age. Ride, Peter Riders. I am so sorry, but I am so proud. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful performances. Thank you both. Again, the goal of Witness is to explore the relationship between the personal and the public, the private and the political. And I think these poets and their work negotiate that space well. Uh, I have another poet at the end of the evening. So I'll, I'll pass the mic to the next part of our program. But thanks again to Trinity Young and Joseph Hart. Okay, do I have the mic now? All yours. Okay, um, I knew this was gonna to be tough as soon as I saw that I was following one of Michelle's poets. And I was like, oh man, how am I gonna follow that? Um, but I, I, um, I'm always inspired and blessed whenever I'm in her poet's presence. So thank you for that, Michelle. And thank um, the young artists, the spoken word artists. I, um, I shared the wrong thing. Bear with me, this is just like class. Um, stop share. Okay, let's see if this will work. And if it doesn't, then I'll just talk you through it. Bear with me.
about the legacies of the movement. What happened? I want to talk a little bit about the legacy of the movement, um, how we look at it and what is left for us to do. I, um, I, I also want to place a little bit of thought into TSU's role in it, um, a role that I think goes underappreciated in the big narrative of the civil rights movement. So it, um, let's, let me start by saying this. Um, all of the events that we discuss um, didn't happen in the ancient past. This stuff is relatively recent. As I think about the movement, I remember that my father would have been maybe was 1960 when all of this went down. So my father would have been in the 11th grade. So that's not old at all. But um, it, it, it's, it's tough, oftentimes it's tough for us to, to even um, conceptualize our, our, our elders being high school students or college students for that matter. So that kind of clouds our, our, our understanding of this period as, as young people. Um, so in understanding that it wasn't that long ago, be mindful that many of the people that participated in this movement, they are still with us today. Um, I used to, I remember going to, um, going to the Cracker Barrel out near Percy Crease um, Dam. And I'd go in there and, and, and look in the corner and I would see uh, Mr. Rip Patton sitting off in the corner with his pancakes or whatever he was eating and, and, and realizing that there's a, a, a giant sitting in this, in this space. So when we understand that was not that long ago, um, we also need to consider that there's a certain part of this history that um, that unfortunately I as an academic and those that trained me and came before me omitted. Um, there are some voices that need to be amplified. There are voices that have been marginalized and we will never truly understand this movement until we engage those sources. So for you students out there, I'm speaking about your grandma or it might be your grandfather that it'd be roughly in their 70s right now. Um, their memories can help fill in the gaps. So we have a living and breathing legacy that we must contend with, that we, we, we must um, engage in order to understand this. Another thing, when you think about this movement as, as TSU students, bear in mind that we don't have a whole lot of monuments, right, for the civil rights movement. And as Professor Wynn gave us so eloquent, an eloquent picture of what the civil rights movement looked like in Nashville, I ask you to sit back and think for a moment. How many monuments do we have for the civil rights movement here in Nashville, a place that played a central role? Okay, we got the witness walls and we got a street named after John Lewis, but that's about it other than the historical markers around town. So you need to start thinking perhaps about places that might be monuments to this period that you do not recognize. And I, and I say this and I'm speaking to Courtney and everybody that ever goes into Elliott Hall, be mindful that, you know, at one time that was the cafeteria on campus. 
And that was the place that many, many of the folks that you read about when you discuss this movement, this is where a lot of them were recruited. So now, whoa, that place, that building becomes something really special when we start thinking about the significance of the movement, right? It becomes a place where somebody might have been invited to participate in the movement, a place where they start thinking about civil rights and equality in ways that they hadn't before. For those of y'all that are familiar with the Baptist church or the, well, with the black church, I remember calling the, calling Elliott Hall the, the, the mourner's bench at Tennessee State University, place where you have an epiphany where you are moved to do something that's life changing. Another point that I wanna make is um, if you're looking for a monument, I would say Keene Hall is a monument to the movement that we might not recognize, right? Because that, 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 that silent march that C.T. Vivian talked about, you know, we talk about it going down Jefferson Street to City Hall, but you never really talk a whole lot about where that march began. Well, I'm here to tell y'all it began at Tennessee State University. So you have the bombing, you have the students getting together, and then they're marching from TSU to downtown. So consider, consider those, 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 those spaces when we look for monuments. Another thing that I want to, if I can get this to work. Another thing that I want you to consider when you think of legacies, you know, oftentimes, um, you hear the seniors criticizing what the young people are doing, right? Yeah, um, particularly when you come to uh, when it comes to the protests that we see out in the street today, and you hear folks saying, "Hey, well, these young folks are doing it the wrong way. This is not the way we did it back then." Um, but I humbly submit to you, these kids are thinking like twenty and twenty-one year olds the same way that they did in the 60s. And the historical record bears this out. The photograph at the bottom of the screen is, is from um, um, the 1960s where the students sat down in the middle of Broadway. They shut down Broadway. This photograph in the upper left-hand corner is, when, is from when the students shut down I-24. And some of you all may remember this. And I remember getting an email from a student um, who said, Dr. Williams, check out the news. Um, you're going to see something. Now, don't ask what I was doing checking my email at 11 o'clock at night, but I just was meant for me to catch that email. So I turned on the news and I saw this image and I hit him up again. I was like, man, be careful because I don't want to have to explain to your mother what happened to you on a bridge here in Nashville. But that made me think, um, the students that participated in the movement at that time, particularly those that sat down in the middle of Broadway, they were putting their lives on the line, the same as these students up in the left-hand corner of the screen. Now, oftentimes think about what that meeting must have been like um, I can imagine somebody saying, hey, we're going to shut down Interstate 24 and some, some people there raising their eyebrows saying, hmm, I don't know. Then others saying, yeah, I'm down. I bet you that same sort of conversation happened in 1960. So what I ask you to consider, and these are for some of us who are a little bit older and some of us who are younger. Um, Understand this, that the, 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 the way we view the world, even though we as young people tend to want to destroy that which our parents have created because our, our parents don't know anything about the way the world really is, right? Even though we do that, um, be mindful that our thoughts are not that different from um, what our elders thought. 
But there's one thing to consider in all of that, particularly if you're young. Your elders have stumbled, stumbled they've fallen, and they have some experiences that would be useful for you. So if you are an activist and you want to build upon this legacy, learn what they did, but also pay attention to where they stumbled, where they made missteps so that you don't do the same thing. One of the most important events of the Nashville movement occurred on April 19, 1960. That's, that'll be the anniversary of that is on Monday, I think, when the home of Z. Alexander Luby was bombed. Um, this was an act of terror, pure and simple. It was violence that was meted out against people that were engaged in nonviolent protests. It was, it was a violent act that was perpetrated against the man that tried to work within the confines of the law. He tried to do it the right way. So I say that to say this. Um, when you are engaged in these type of activities, where you're engaged in efforts to obtain violence, I mean, efforts to obtain justice, to obtain freedom, the responses you get are going to be, be nonviolent, but you can almost expect to have some violent act because act perpetrated against you because that's how the game has always been played in America. So um, you can expect a nonviolent response, but be mindful that um, there are some folks out there that are going to try to hurt you or maybe even kill you. As we look at the civil rights leaders from um, this period, the most effective ones didn't live to be old men. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Malcolm X was assassinated. Um, um, and now as I, as I think about it, um, Fred Hampton, who's a little bit outside of this period, he was killed in his bed in Chicago. So I'm saying all that to say this, expect one of the legacies of this is um, both nonviolent and violent responses. But this is um, a, a legacy that we, um, that, I, that I think it's, it's important for us to appreciate, but it's also important for us to have deep conversations with them about everything that transpired and get their real feelings behind it and, and, and to um, consult and ask them for advice. Um, because these, these folks are um, slowly leaving us. As I look at this photograph, I see Mr. Kaysen and, and Kwame Lillard, they are no longer with us. Um, but also bear in mind as we look at these people, these are TSU alums. And as such, they are sources of both inspiration and affirmation. Um, sometimes I could, I can remember when um, Ms. McLean was on campus and every, every April she would hold, uh, put up um, that, that poster, those mug shots of uh, civil rights activists. And I'd catch her in the hall and, and I was fortunate in that I could ask her a lot of the questions that I wanted to know in grad school, but could not, you know, I, I couldn't have, I, couldn't, I didn't have anybody that could answer them. And one of the questions that I would oftentimes ask her was, um, 
How did the how did people come out on the back end of all of this? Um, Professor Wynn mentioned that bus being um, bombed in Anniston. And I can imagine people coming out of that experience traumatized, traumatized in a way that it would take a while for them to recover, or maybe they never really recovered. So I would point at a picture and she would name the person that was on the picture and then tell me about their families, their marriages and so forth. So it, it brought a certain level of humanity to what had simply just been photographs before. In our public spaces, um, these, the, our, our public spaces in reality link us to the past in really profound ways. The photograph on the left is one of Stokely Carmichael and um, H. Rapp Brown and George Ware as they're leaving the Kefauver building. It's right downtown on Broadway. Photograph on the right is a photograph I took um, on the day we marched on the courthouse and the aftermath of the Mike Brown murder. And it was one of those days where the community itself was in trauma and there was a whole bunch of pain and I was feeling a certain kind of way too. But then I, I saw this young girl and she's probably in high school now. I saw her lifting up the card and leaning on her mother. And, and um, all of this is going on while people are saying, saying their, their piece at, at, this, at this space. And I thought about this picture of, of, um, of where Carmichael and Brown and how you know, she was connected to that protest in a really profound way that I had not recognized before. So now when I walk past there, you know, I do remember that this was an important spot in the 60s, but I also remember that was a really important spot when I first arrived at TSU. So there's a legacy of protests that also exists in certain spaces in this town. This is my last one. This is a protest that was held at TSU um, when my dear friend Jeff Carr took over the administration building at TSU. Um, he and he was um, student government president at the time, and they had reached a point where they were just fed up because um, because TSU was underfunded. The, 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 um, the buildings were um, in terrible conditions. So they demanded that something be done. And in order to do this, what they did was they took over the humanities building. And as I thought about it, and I talked to them um, last year during Black History Month, I met with them and um, they just talked about being fed up. And they needed to do something. And the something that they did was very big because they took over the administration building and they demanded to be heard. So I'm saying this um, to you TSU students out there. Um, your education, the thing that you are experiencing right now um, at TSU, um, it's something where the, the foundation has been laid long before you all got there. You all are standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, I can almost guarantee that if I probe a little bit closer, I'll find other instances where TSU students have protested and made a difference. So I'm saying this to you. Your legacy is one of protests. Your legacy is one where you identify something not being right and you step out and you try to make it right. 
when you tigers out there, you might not win every battle. Y'all might not win every battle, but I can guarantee you that you not gonna lose. And with that, I will close and thank you for your attention. Yeah, click stop share. I'll come back though. Michelle, can you unmute yourself? Okay, I didn't know if I was next. <laughs> I'm sorry, I lost track. What a wonderful presentation. And um, I guess, again, another transition um, into what our TSU students can do. Uh, one thing that we emphasize in LLP is voice and using our voice and expression communication to help create change. Um, as part of that initiative, we have a poet here who is representing Soul Fire Poetry Group. Soul Fire Poetry Group meets weekly uh, to workshop both uh, poetry of the page and poetry of the stage. Um, but in recent weeks and months, we have been building to our current initiative, which is the I Want to Write Poetry Workshop Series. Um, the workshop series offers creative writing poetry workshops throughout the month of April commemorating Poetry Month. Um, this year's theme is Poetic Justice, workshops um, in poetic activism. So all of the workshops this month are geared towards how to write poetry of activism. And I'm just going to post the link uh, to the conference, the workshop um, series. But Miss Angetta Williams uh, is here representing Soul Fire. We, in recent weeks, we've carried on this conversation of civil rights uh, protest and thinking of ways to incorporate the contemporary, pro to learn from the previous protest and incorporate that spirit um, into our contemporary poetic. So um, I ch challenged Miss uh, Angetta Williams to write a poem inspired or that reflects on uh, the civil rights movement. And tonight we are going to hear her wonderful words and her interpretation. So without further ado, I can pass the mic to Miss Angetta Williams. Thank you, Dr. Pinker. Um, first off, it's honored to be able to do this. Um, my poem is kind of past and present. It reflects on the Freedom Riders and what they did. And it, it also reflects some on the, the killings that we've been having um, with our black males, especially since one of them was my son-in-law. My poem is entitled, No Justice, No Peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. They said justice is blind. Hmm. This is so true. Cause the blindfold is fixed so you can see only one color, white. White should stand for pure purity, but it only stands for no justice, no peace. Last time I saw you justice, you were running away with Jim Crow. Now your name is no longer justice. It's just us. 
meaning just us white folks. No justice, no peace. Just us. You and Jim Crow used to run and thing. Every time Jim Crow and his cowardly friends in white sheets gifted the sepia, cinnamon, and chocolate boys with new neckties, you, you pull your blindfold tighter. On occasion, you even turn your head. No justice, no peace. Because God always have a ram in the bush, your days were numbered. On May 14th, 1961, 13 fearless people jumped on a greyhound. By this time, even some white folks were tired of you running around with Jim Crow. No justice, no peace. Before day one morning, the air was still cool and crisp. The Greyhound roared down the highway, tires making a rhythmic connection to the asphalt. Only the warm breath droplets meeting the cool air, feeling it like smoke from an old coal stove could be seen. As the bus slowly crept into Anderson, Alabama, there was a reception waiting, a reception of about 200 white folks with gifts of steel pipes and chains. Crash, glass flew, glass filled the air raining down like sharp crystals of ice. Boom, silence, then smoke. Without provocation or notification, the silence was broken. Claim, claim, change, connecting, ripping, and tearing flesh. Bones snapping as they collide with steel pipes. Blood was flying like raindrops falling from heaven. Still, no justice, no peace. Just us. When will you stand for truth? Lives were lost by the hand at the hands of Jim Crow and his cowardly friends. Just us. When will you? Take your dignity, dignity back. When will you become justice for Jacquees? When will you become justice for Daniel? When you, will you become justice for Brianna? We will ride for freedom, fight for freedom, walk for freedom until injustice is no longer a threat to justice anywhere. Can I pass out now, y'all? <laughs> that was excellent. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Miss Williams. I'm just going to close uh, the poetry portion by saying I tell this proverb to all of my poetry students. Until the lion tells his own story, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter, right? And so poetry, art, language provides a space and an opportunity for the lion to speak. And uh, three lions spoke tonight. So thank you, thank you. Thank you everybody, that was phenomenal. Um, now I, I would like to open it up if anyone does have any um, questions or reflections, we can take a few minutes. Um, I made it so that you could unmute yourself if you would like um, to comment. But thank you again, everyone, for, for coming this evening. I just want to say it's an honor to be in a, be here today and to be able to read my, my poem and and just celebrate the anniversary, the 60, 60th anniversary of the Freedom Riders. It's an honor, and I'm just so happy to be part of the program. So thank you again, um, Professor, for, for putting it out for us to come and join this program. So I thank you so very much, Professor Pickett. Pickett. I would like to add, I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. Um, although I was born June 1960, um, things were still kind of hinky back then. Um, and we were the last to integrate. We didn't start integrating to the early 70s. So I truly understand a lot of it because my parents and grandparents went through it. So writing that poem was kind of like going home. 
and I really do appreciate the opportunity to do it. Thank you. So in closing, I'll just give out some thank yous um, real quick. Um, first and foremost, um, Katie Delmay for putting the show together, um, the Frist Art Museum. Um, we had um, help from uh, two art preparators to hang the show, um, Scott Tom and Doobie Tompkins. Um, I'd like to thank my department, um, Art and Design. Um, I have a great department. They are super supportive on everything I do in the department and um, make amazing art. We've got great professors. So, um, Communications department, shout out to Shanti Mason Chambers. Um, of course, LLP, um, Dr. Pinkard, um, who is the chair of the department and her I Want to Write initiative. Um, I put the link in uh, the chat, but you can Google. Um, they have other publications that they've done through the years and they are all phenomenal. So I highly suggest checking it out. Um, Linda Wynn, thank you so much for your time and energy and research um, and for being just a Nashville treasure. Um, Dr. Williams, who is always a pleasure to have um, in any situation and always brings um, insight and um, Nashville history wherever he goes. The Tennessean and the Nashville Public Library, um, special collections that houses the Nashville Banner for making this accessible, um, and then Vanderbilt University Press um, for the publication of the book. <laughs>